Joining us now on the line from Washington, D.C., Jose Raul Perales. He is Senior Program Associate in the Latin American Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Jose Raul, it's good to have you on the line from D.C. How are you tonight? Doing well, thank you. Glad to hear it. Let me start by reading something that Jose Orozco wrote in Religious Scope several years ago on the topic that we're going to discuss tonight. Long considered a monolithic Roman Catholic bloc, Latin America is undergoing a religious transformation. About 15% of Latin Americans have converted to evangelical Christianity, making it the fastest growing religion in the region. A few years ago, the Latin American Catholic Bishops Conference claimed that 8,000 Latin Americans converted to evangelical Christianity every day. What do you think is the appeal of this kind of religious conversion to Latin Americans? There are several reasons. One is that uh, there is a much plural political and social space in Latin America with the advent of democracy in the 1980s, and this has reached every aspect of society in the region, including religion. So the idea that only one manifestation of the faith is the real one has, has receded substantially. So now you have a variety of religious expressions. Even within the Catholic Church, you have uh, a variety of expressions. Uh, also, uh, a tremendous amount of violence of everyday life, not just crime and gangs, but also problems of inequality, injustice, uh, domestic violence, etc., that push people in the direction of the faith and of finding multiple avenues of faith that are very near them and that can speak to their experience. A uh, third reason is reach. Uh, evangelicals speak individually to believers to recruit them, to bring them uh, relief to their, to their pain and their sorrow. And in this way, they actually do serve a very important social function of mediating uh, excruciating circumstances. And in this sense, people feel an appeal, an appeal to faith. The movement has been particularly strong, I gather, in Brazil, and there are evangelicals serving in the government of Brazil. But what were the conditions you believe that led to this strong growth and government role for evangelicals? Well, part of it is the result of, one, their increased clout in society, right? They are becoming a much more present social actor, and usually this translates into a, uh, a more active life even in politics. Uh, also, it's the fact that the Catholic Church for a very long time had been a political actor throughout most of Latin America, and since, as I said before, the Catholic, the, the religious space, I'm sorry, in Latin America is becoming more plural, that function of the Catholic Church to be also associated or have a position on matters of politics is also now being contested as well by evangelicals. You also have to remember that many of the issues that appeal to evangelicals in questions of morality, human rights, etc., are also very political questions. And as they gain more confidence as social actors, this also translates into an interest in how decisions about these topics are made. Hmm. Just curious, uh, Hugo Chavez has apparently also found a way to work with evangelicals, and I wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that he is, how do we want to put it, in a clash with the Catholic Church, let's put it that way. Well, it's a very interesting question because Venezuela is a country where religion has not traditionally been an instrument of politics, either in terms of the Catholic Church or in terms of evangelicals or any other Protestant uh, religion. What we're seeing now is that because Venezuelan society is so polarized and so politicized, you have all varieties of spaces of social activity being, uh, being co-opted by the, the, the important political conflict that is going on in the country. And so what we're seeing is uh, movements within evangelical churches pro and against Chavez, both of them, and also the Catholic Church pro and against Chavez. As I said, one assumption that we have made for a very long time is that there is a monolithic Catholic Church and a multiplicity of evangelical churches. Within the Catholic Church itself, there is also dissension. But certainly, in terms of a confrontation with a, with a hierarchy of the Catholic Church that has become, uh, or that has assumed a, a countenance position to Chavez, certainly uh, the, 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 the facility that evangelicals provide uh, Chavez as a platform to address these issues is certainly useful. I want to ask you about the socioeconomic basis for this, because some have referred to evangelical Christianity as the so-called you know, religion of the poor. And I wonder whether evangelicals have been able to broaden the base beyond uh, the poorest civilians in Latin America. Uh, that is, that is a, a very good question. And uh, the vision has evolved, actually. Their, their position has evolved uh, quite a bit. 
Uh, in the beginning, yes, evangelicals, like many faiths, uh, especially in the 1970s when they started making big inroads in the region, uh, their appeal precisely was towards the poorest of the poor, uh, the most destitute parts of, uh, of society. Uh, again, because of the message of salvation, the message of addressing pr more immediate problems of violence and scarcity. Um, a lot of this has evolved, a lot of this has changed, and as you point out, the people from the evangelical churches, in the case of Brazil, that have access to government are people that do not come from the poorest echelons of society. By the same token, the churches, the evangelical churches, have now access to media, to property, resources, investments, and it is a way in which they have also established an independent source of income. You have to remember that in most parts of Latin America, the Catholic Church for a very long time had a monopoly on all the variety of subsidies from the state because of the relationship that the church had with governments in the region. Once democracy comes and those preferential relationships start, start breaking open, you also have evangelical churches participating in this. And so there is a renegotiation of that relationship, subsidies, privileges, uh, the whole idea of nonprofit organizations that has taken a ground in Latin America. And so they've managed to become very successful entrepreneurs as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's an organizational strategy. It's a defensive strategy. Well, let me make sure we understand where they are on the, uh, I guess, uh, social conservative political spectrum as well. In the United States, of course, you think of evangelicals, and you definitely think of them as being to the right of the social conservative movement. Uh, is that the case as well in Latin America? Are they, you know, in the main, are we talking about people who are pro-life, pro-death penalty, um, against gay rights, that kind of thing? Well, yes, for the most part, although what constitutes the right in Latin America is slightly different than in the United States. Uh, but in, in, in general, yes. So, for example, yes, they are against uh, gay rights. They are against abortion. Uh, in some countries in Latin America where divorce is very recent, for example, in Chile, uh, they do stand against uh, divorce, and they're very conservative regarding the roles of uh, women and women's rights. Uh, very strong visions about the family and the importance of family, which has a consequence for instance, on patterns of migration. Uh, one of the, there's a, a researcher at the University of Flo in Florida, I'm sorry, uh, who has, who is studying precisely whether Catholics or evangelicals migrate more. And one thing that he has found is actually that te they tend to be more towards the Catholic uh, church. And one of the things that he's trying to prove is whether it's Catholics that migrate more because the evangelicals place such a big emphasis on the strength of the family that members of the family feel less tempted to migrate. Hmm. So yes, they are very conservative. I want to read something else to you right now, and, and uh, what do I say? Get comfortable. This one's a little bit longer than the first one. Pedro Moreno <laughs> wrote this in Leadership U. Uh, here we go. Pentecostals are generally credited with providing a sense of community to the masses, migrating from the countryside to the cities, and with preaching a message that concentrates on the power of God, not only to comfort spiritually, but also to help materially. The British sociologist David Martin has studied the impact of Pentecostalism in Tongues of Fire, the explosion of Protestantism in Latin America, arguing that the Pentecostals have created so-called free spaces where a new ethos can develop. Former prostitutes, drunkards, and adulterers freely testify to their conversions. Finding a sense of purpose in their new beliefs, many have developed abilities within the church, leadership, organization, public speaking, etc., that improve their daily work and help them rise economically. The significance of all this, according to Forbes magazine, goes beyond theology. Quote, the old order, based upon a rigid hierarchy and social immobility, has broken down. This religious dissonance is furthering modernization in Latin America, taking advantage of the new pluralism and democracy, and the collapse of the communist threat allowed to develop in political and economic realms. Uh, this notion of free spaces that have been created what do you think that means? That's a big question. Uh, one of the things, it addresses part of what I was trying to say at the beginning of our conversation, is that with uh, the process of democratization in Latin America in the 1980s, one of the big consequences of, uh, of the process of democratization, how it happened and who brought it along, was that it wasn't just a matter of having a plural political space where you have multiple forces of political parties and different political groups competing for power, but also in terms of civil society, in terms of the fabric of organizations, entities that make up uh, society in general, that space also opened up. And one of the most important areas where this organization took place in society was precisely religion. 
Whereas before you had that monopoly of the Catholic Church occupying the notion, the, the space of faith in society with the advent of democracy and because of the types of involvements that people had in organizations based on faith to prosecute crimes for, uh, from the dictatorships, to pursue human rights, to rebuild the social fabric of families that were destroyed by the dictatorships, once you remove these dictatorships and you have the advent of democracy, civil society also becomes plural and open. And now you have a much more open space of organization of many areas, including the faith. And so it is a contested space. The Catholic Church isn't now the only manifestation of the faith. It now has a variety of organizations, as you mentioned, uh, evangelicals, Pentecostals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it is a, a much richer space, but also within the Catholic Church, you have a variety of organizations contesting for what the Catholic Church ought to do and ought to behave. So indeed, the space is indeed wide open. If the space is wider open and if there is more competition for it, do you think people in general are better off because of that? Definitely, completely. People are finding faith more meaningful. Uh, they are recommunicating with it. And in fact, this goes to counter a notion that many people have for many years. And in fact, is something that I think comes out of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the statement that you, that you read to me, is that many people have always thought that once a country becomes more, more developed or becomes wealthier, that somehow that brings in a process of secularization, that people start moving away from uh, the church and religion as a point of organization of their daily lives towards more secular pursuits, more secular activities. One thing we're seeing in Latin America is that that doesn't hold true, that the, hmm. even as these societies become wealthier, in case of Brazil, Chile, etc., you still have a presence of religion in everyday lives. And so uh, it is actually very good that there is an open space where people can find a more personalized rela uh, relationship with their faith. Well, having said that, Timothy Goodman, a former fellow with the American Enterprise Institute, has been critical of the church and says that any economic growth will be in spite of them and not because of them. Do you think that's too harsh? I think it is, I, I would even say that it is not related. I mean, I, the, the Catholic Church has not been an actor in terms of producing economic development or in hindering it. I think that there is very little relationship to say about the church as an economic actor. I think he's referring to the evangelical church here, not the Catholic Church. Uh, same here. I mean, the, the evangelical churches are behaving, in a sense, uh, very entrepreneurially. I mean, they are working uh, to establish a position. If it's a competition, a plural space, uh, they're using the rules of competition. And in this sense, they're very, behaving very with a big element of entrepreneurship. Uh, whether that translates directly or automatically into wealth and economic development, that's a different story. Uh, whether the church tells people that having wealth is incorrect or is bad, I don't see any church uh, teaching that in Latin America, or certainly not the, uh, not the evangelicals or the Protestants. Uh, so I would say that, uh, that it's, uh, yeah, I would, I, would, I would say the same. Okay, let me try another academic here. Here's Lawrence Harrison, who sees the evangelical churches in Latin America as a progressive force compared to the more, of course, conservative affiliations in the United States. What do your studies indicate on that scale? Well, uh, again, you have to look at the range of evangelical churches. Uh, in some areas, yes, indeed, they are more progressive than in case of the United States because they relate a lot more to the everyday life experiences of people as opposed to preaching how they should behave, which is, uh, it's, 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 it's a, their emergence is a response to problems that they are countering in society, very real problems of violence, of uh, inequality, of, of uh, aggressiveness, really, of, of the harshness of everyday life in many parts of Latin America, and in this sense, they're not prescriptive about behavior, but actually become mediators between people and the everyday lives that they have to endure. In this sense, they are radically different from the case of the United States, in the sense that in the United States, yes, indeed, in many cases in the United States, churches do mediate those relationships, but it, it, the way in which they do so is rather differently. Uh, and thus in Latin America same, seems more progressive using the description that you that you posit. Okay, let's, let's bring liberation theology into this mix, because, which of course was a, a very significant force uh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, Latin American Bishop um, Hoyos has denounced liberation theologians saying, quote, when I see a church with a machine gun, I cannot see the crucified Christ in that church. Now I wonder if you think whether the history of liberation Catholics fighting what they saw as the oppressors 
became something that people were trying to move away from now that they have a more free religious marketplace. That's, that's very true. Uh, liberation theology was an expression of, uh, of the faith at a time when precisely most of Latin America was governed not only by dictatorships and governments that practice a substantial amount of repression, but there was also uh, a very exclusive relationship between government and society, whereas uh, the church itself uh, had taken a position of alliances with government uh, as part of the ruling class and much of the peasantry and the citizenry were repressed or eliminated or, or, or taken aside from uh, participatory politics or participating in, in, in social life more fully. Liberation theology became a manifestation of first a radical change that happened in the church starting in 1968 where the church uh, made an objective option for the poor where the church uh, established as a doctrine that this type of inequality was simply going against the preachings of Jesus Christ and that it was assuming a more involved position uh, with, uh, with society. In this sense, the church became a mediator, a haven uh, for people that were being persecuted by dictatorial regimes, repressed. In some cases where there was civil war, the government, uh, the church actually became uh, openly confrontational with the government that was fighting uh, against people who were seeking a more just and an open society. So liberation theology in some of these instances became the theological faithful manifestation of that option for the poor. Again, as the, 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 the religious space and the political space became more, more plural and open, the resort to that kind of theology became less necessary. And so liberation theology became something of uh, a common phenomenon in the sense that it, it, it lost a lot of its uh, of the need for confrontation and it assumed a more individual perspective on people's faith. Hmm. I guess, uh, time does march faster than I think it does because you're right it was it was longer ago than 20 years ago now that I think of it I guess it was at its height when Ronald Reagan was president which is 30 years ago already time does march on. Or, or even um, before more than 40. Absolutely no you're right. Um, now liberation Catholics are also you know they were leftists fighting with leftist guerrillas but they were also conservatives who were providing money to you know, money and guns for that matter to the Contras as well in Nicaragua. So uh, I wonder how, how do people see the church's role as it relates to so-called terror tactics, be it of the left or of the right? Well, it's, it's, an, it's a very good question. Uh, the relationship between violence and religion has a very entrenched history in Latin America because if you, you have to remember that the very first violence the Latin American encounter was a violence of evangelization, right, of the, of the Spanish conquistadors that came with the priests. Uh, and that was indeed a relationship of violence. So some people would say that violence is almost an intrinsic feature of uh, expressions of religion and faith in Latin America since its inception. So in this latter stage of, uh, of, uh, of the Catholic Church as a social actor, uh, where we see the church uh, having to assume a position of violence. In some cases, you have the case of Camilo Torres in Colombia, the bishop who became a guerrilla fighter. Uh, it is an extreme manifestation that the church usually does not take. I mean, again, there are instances where the church has become a space where the resistance to the oppression of government has taken the form of violence. But the church itself has rarely, uh, as an institution, uh, it rarely became an instrument of violence. In fact, what happened to the Catholic Church throughout many Latin American countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, Peru, for example, countries where civil wars were fought, is that the church became objects of the violence of the state precisely because the church took a direct position against the repression that the state was carrying through. And of course, because there were countries involved in the civil war, in the eyes of the state, the church became automatically an ally of the guerrillas, where the situation was a lot more complicated than that. Okay, Jose Raul, in our last uh, few minutes here, let me read one more quote to you and then get you to comment on this. Uh, this is from the Christian Science Monitor. According to a global survey carried out by the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life in 2006, Guatemala and Brazil harbor the largest communities of renewalists as a percentage of their populations, 60% in Guatemala and 50% in urban Brazil. Evangelicals have exerted growing influence in political spheres as churches, which first drew members among the poor, have become more attractive to the middle and upper classes. One impact of all this might be to make Christianity more conservative worldwide. True, Pentecostals in Latin America are hard to pigeonhole. 
They tend to be more liberal than their U.S. counterparts on economic policy, but just as conservative on homosexuality and abortion. Tell me this, do you see any evidence that evangelicals are having a policy impact in places like Brazil? Yes, but the, the impact that they are, seem to be having is a, a lot more local, a lot more focal point. Uh, they're not coming to government necessarily because they want to carry an evangelical agenda, but they do see it as their mission to bring uh, elements of morality into questions of politics. And of course, they do have a bigger presence the more local the politics that we're talking about. So once we start moving, remember Brazil is a really big country and it's a federal country like the United States. The more we go to the local municipalities or councils or cities, for example, where we do see evangelicals involved in politics, the more you will see that type of effect. Whereas in national politics, their ability to influence the stage, uh, the national political stage, uh, is rather diminished at this point. How about uh, the impact that evangelicals might have on uh, Latin America's political institutions? Any examples of that? Uh, well, one important aspect of what uh, evangelicals have been able to do, uh, and again, this comes a little bit in line with the notion that it is a plural social space, has to do with uh, social missions of governments, uh, programs, for example, for conditional cash transfers, and the types of social policies the governments have been pursuing in the region uh, to address the poor. In many instances, in Latin American countries, we seem to have instances very similar to faith, what in the United States we call faith-based initiatives, which is basically that because in some instances it's the evangelical churches or evangelical institutions that are better organized to carry out certain functions of social policy, they have started to work in tandem with uh, institutions of the state addressing social policy questions and steer policy in that direction. Again, it's an early stage to say that there is a moral mission that they are carrying into the way in which such policies are, are to be followed. And again, because Latin American societies are a lot more pragmatic than people would seem to believe, or especially that what would seem to indicate because of the enormous growth of evangelicals and Pentecostals. There's a tremendous space of pragmatism and of negotiation, precisely a big plural space, uh, where there are a lot of ways in which this can become manifested. Well, let me just follow up on that and make sure I understand you, because th certainly there is a faction within the United States of evangelicals who get into public life with the express purpose of making America a more evangelical slash Christian country. And they are not buying this separation of church and state. And, you know, they fight that fight at the ballot box, and some win and some lose. I'm wondering if it's if you see evidence of the same thing happening in Latin America, where you have evangelical candidates whose intention it is to get into public life in Latin America, again, for the express purpose of making Latin American countries more slash evangelical slash Christian in the way uh, that they relate to their citizens in the world. Not to the extent of the United States. Not to the extent of the United States. But it, it's not even the evangelicals only. For example, in Paraguay, you have a president who used to be a bishop. Uh, who is now uh, president of the country and, again, whose morality has been questioned because of the fact that he fathered many children while he was uh, still a bishop. So uh, that space is, again, as I said, you don't have those types of expressions into politics that I am going to get into politics to make the space more moral or to clean up politics uh, for whatever reason. We don't see that yet. I'm not discounting the possibility that in the future there might be something like that, but I just don't see evidence of the region moving in that direction. Can you see a candidate in the next, uh, you know, short while, let's say in the next five years, an evangelical Protestant winning the presidency of a major country in Latin America on a platform of, if not cleaning up society, how about, uh, you know, bringing an, a, an extra special morality to public life? I can see somebody talking about morality in public life, but not on the basis of an evangelical platform. Hmm. So while there's a toehold, uh, there's a long way to go, I guess. Is that what you're telling us? There's a breach. Whether the evangelical church is moving in that direction remains to be seen. I don't see evidence of the church assuming a position uh, in that sense. I don't see the evangelical church is still developing the type of political platform that is required to position a candidate to be uh, a national presidential candidate, for example. Again, I'm not discounting that possibility, but perhaps what I'm saying is that we, we're at a crossroads where 
as we define what that plural religious space is in Latin America and how it is developing, remember, this is a fairly recent phenomenon in the region. Uh, it remains to be seen whether the, these churches actually do or one of these churches moves in that direction. Understood. Jose Raul Perales from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. It's good of you to join us on the line from Washington tonight. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Same here.